Hey, this is Web3 Talks, the podcast where we learn how to build Web3 projects directly from Web3 founders. My name is Maciej Budkowski and I talk with the founders about their projects, business models, technology, community building, user acquisition strategies, and more. If you want to start your own project or are just curious about the space, this podcast will bring you answers. Stay tuned. Hello, Austin. Like, I'm very happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Because like, for those who don't know Austin yet, like, he's like a builder at heart. Like, when I was preparing for this episode, I went through Austin's website and read about all his builds, all, all the projects that he has built. And from robot controlled by PlayStation Portable through automatic fish feeder, Facebook apps, horse racing game, open source CMS, AI powered battle game, decentralized Ethereum oracles, cloud orchestration software, NFT creation platform, and like more, more, more things. So I really can feel like when I was reading that, that you are a person that focuses on really getting stuff out there, which is a very useful skill to have as a builder because it's so easy to get inside your head and don't build anything at all and just try to theorize all the time. So that's why I am so excited to have Austin today. And Austin is also a very famous person in Ethereum society. He educated like hundreds or maybe thousands of developers. So yeah, he's a big uh, person in this community. But you know, before we get into the details of your projects and process, could you tell us the story, like how you ended up in Web3? Because you haven't started in Web3, obviously. <laughs> you started in the 90s, as far as I know. Right, yep. <laughs> so a lot of the projects you listed there and even my kind of my ethos is to just ship things and to understand that they won't be perfect and to understand that we can sit around and strategize forever, but without trying something and seeing how it works and repeating that process, you can only learn so much from strategy, right? Like as soon as you mm. get punched in the face the first time, it, it your strategy <laughs> goes out the window, right? I can't remember the exact tweet. So there's a lot of products that I put out that are like, not 100% great products. They're, I tried and we saw what, what worked. And like, <laughs> I had this listing projects. I had this brew rig in my garage and it would actually like brew beer from start to finish. Things would go across the scale. There was even a moment where I would remotely light a flame and boil beer. And <laughs> sometimes I was like at my office working on something at my old Web2 job and I would you know, pull it up and light the fire for, in my garage, right? <laughs> so there are certain things that were a little bit more mission critical that had to work perfectly. And there are other things that were just like, eh, like the tank would fill up with water. And for me to understand that the tank was full, I was watching the weight and it would start to drain. And as soon as the weight would stop going up, then I knew that the tank was full. And that was a total, <laughs> you know, weird little hack. Instead of using a fancy scale, I used a weird hack, right? So mm -hmm. you got to know, you got to know like what's mission critical and what's something that we can tinker with and, and learn with. So to answer the question though, I was building lots of stuff. I got very deep into Docker and infrastructure in code and microservices. And I built a piece of software to help the developers at the company I was working at scale up. We went from four developers to 28 developers in a year And we had to go to a different architecture. A mono repo wasn't working anymore. And so I kind of pioneered this idea within the company of microservices and also just like making it very easy for people to launch services. They could kind of prototype them on their machine and then deploy them to our cloud using this cool orchestration software that I built. And then I wasn't able to open source it. And like 28 mm -hmm. people total have ever used it or 50 people total. And that <laughs> just like breaks my heart. If that was an open source piece of software at the time, it would have probably been forked and used by a lot of people. So that kind of like nudged me toward open source a lot more. And then kind of because I was in the hole with Docker, I totally missed Ethereum at first. And then sometime in 2017, I kind of popped up and looked around and said, holy cow, this smart contract thing is really neat. Building decentralized applications that, that are like basically 
unstoppable, right? If I build the application correctly, it isn't just always on. I can't even stop it if I want to, right? And that's a whole different paradigm and trust and and there's new things coming out. So I went from Docker and closed source to this has to be open source. We have to look at ways of building our ethos into our code and having money at the base of the protocol and having that built in. And so that sent me into a spiral of learning Web3, building little things. I started with like Truffle and had a bunch of problems with it. And I ended up building my own like orchestration software that kind of led to Scaffold ETH. Mm -hmm. I built a couple games. I built this game called Galleass that has these little ships sailing and there's ERC-721s and ERC-20s and all of those like at the end of 2017, that was quite a novel thing. But Mm -hmm. the space was so small and no one cared. Then I built a few more products, but what really started to resonate, where I really found my place in Web3 was within this tooling space, within this education space, showing off that you don't have to be a hyper genius to figure this stuff out. Even Austin at the middle of the the bell curve can both Mm -hmm. build this stuff and teach other people to build this stuff. So the place that I really found that I had impact was through education and through tooling and through teaching. And that's kind of where things have led me today. Yeah, thank you for that. Because, you know, I had the same feeling when I learned about Ethereum. You know, we obviously learn about Vitalik, who's like a mutant developer. And you kind of feel, oh, if I'm not like Vitalik, I cannot just develop any smart contract at all. So, you know, making it more approachable to more people, I think it's super important because At the end of the day, it's just a programming language. It also has, like, it's different constraints than other languages, but, you know, like, you can learn it just like you can learn, you know, C or, you know, Java or whatever. It's a simple language. The syntax is actually pretty simple. Like, if you're a Web2 developer, you should be able to pick up Solidity very quickly. And you just need to think of it like you're building a microcontroller. Like it's it's the thing that's starting the fire and you need to make sure the fire <laughs> fires and you're not leaking gas into your garage, right? It's, it's, it is a mission critical thing, but a lot of this code is written for you. And we've seen in the last year, there's not a ton of innovation that happened at the smart contract level in terms of mm-hmm. NFTs. And I would love to see them more of that. But there's a lot of NFTs that got launched. What we saw is like an artist can take an open Zeppelin implementation of the NFT and add maybe one or two lines of code, but not have to be a Vitalik level coder and they could launch their own NFT project. And of course, we'd love to see more innovation at the Solidity level. But what you're saying here is like, A, the language is not that hard to learn. And B, there's a lot of stuff written for you, so your innovation can be small. And there's a lot of stuff that's kind of done and safe and tested already that you can employ to build the thing you want to build. So there's a great entry point, I think, into the space. But in the long run, let's see some more innovation at the solidity level, too. Yeah, and, you know, talking about innovation, like my absolutely favorite product of yours is if Build. Uh, for those <laughs> who don't know, it's like a tool for prototyping web free apps and like the secret sauce is that you can visualize this code so it's just like a drag and drop tool like all these no code or low code platforms more like low code because you can code there as well and even if you don't know solidity very well like i am actually on this crypto zombies level of smart contracts understanding you can really like try to understand the logic behind it and see how different things connect to each other and impact them. So could you tell the story of this project, how you came up with that and, and how have you developed that tool? One of the biggest reasons why I built ETH Build was I had a hard time explaining certain things like key pairs and how a key pair can sign and all the different chains and what different block numbers the chains are on and what a signed transaction looks like. Just how to make a function call on a smart contract, right? It's like kind of complicated stuff and I wanted a way to explain it better. And I also wanted my own like little tinkering sandbox. And that's what ETH build became. It took Lightgraph and I extended it and kind of made it into React and made it like it even feels very elementary, right? It feels like the primary colors. It feels like you're getting into something simple and visual. And after you build something for a little bit, it looks like very complicated pretty quickly, but it's good for showing off and explaining topics. 
And that's basically what I used it for. Like if you go to ETH build now, you'll see an entire curriculum there that's built around kind of like teaching Ethereum to new people that are trying to get the fundamentals. And so the whole goal of the project at first was like me just tinkering, but then it's like, okay, like I'm on these mentorship sessions, I'm on a Zoom session and I'm trying to explain to a developer how a key pair works. ETH build makes that way easier now. And it was just like, what things do I need to explain hashes, key pairs, distributed ledgers, the Byzantine general problem, you know, proof of work consensus, smart contracts, transactions, those kind of like fundamental things are hard to explain. But when you can do it in a very visual way where it's like, okay, I generate a PK and you can see the PK here. And and then from that is derived an address and we can send money to that address. And then we can query this, like wire it up. So we query the balance from the blockchain. Just like that kind of like visceral kind of wiring things up and seeing things visually really helps me learn and then helps me kind of like reteach that material to other folks after I've learned. So it was all about education and tinkering. Okay. And how long has this taken for you to build it? I feel like ETH build took like maybe six months, maybe eight months. It was at a time where like my son was in the ICU. So I was going to the hospital a lot and it was a lot of like sitting at the hospital, kind of just like waiting for things. So it was kind Mm -hmm. of a nice break to be able to like pull out my laptop and forget about some things that are going on around me for a little bit. And so probably like six to eight months of building. And it's been pretty good now. It's basically like kind of stable. I'm I'm always looking for someone to help me, you know, support it a little bit more. But ETH build to what it can do, it's kind of like it's pretty limited in terms of if you want to build something complex and lots of modules, it starts to fall apart and get way too complex. But if you want to explain Mm -hmm. something simple, it works for that. And I've kind of like, I built it up enough to do that and I can explain simple things with it, but it doesn't get you to tinkering with solidity the way I wanted it to. And that's where Mm -hmm. Scaffold ETH and some other projects came in. But yeah, probably six to eight months. And now it's like now and then there's a little bit of maintaining that happens. And if you're a builder out there that uses ETH build and you enjoy it, reach out to me and, and we can, you know, maybe set something up and I can get some help just building new things with it and adding new components and just supporting things as they go along. Cool. This is a nice offer. Like if you are a builder listening to it, take this chance. Really, you can accelerate your understanding of Solidity by talking with Austin for sure. For sure. You know, like you, Austin, are a person that can really explain these complex technical things in a, in a very layman terms. But, you know, most builders can't do it. Like I met a lot of Builders and you know there are so many memes and jokes about developers that just cannot <laughs> communicate with yeah. people and and explain their you know things they have in mind. So I'm wondering like how do you make this happen? Do you have any process for preparing your educational materials or is it just like you know you see it in your dreams and then you <laughs> you know you have a way to explain a new term? I think my secret weapon is not being a genius. I think a lot of the folks that you're referring to are kind of at like a neurodivergent level. They see things in their dreams about, you know, solidity and assembly and how it <laughs> saves, you know, a thousand gas if, if I do it this way, right? And that's like, that stuff is way beyond me. I really am like, I feel like I'm good at applying my caveman brain to things. And so when I use a product, I can scope out the user experience and understand like, are real people going to be able to use this or not, right? And so Mm -hmm. same thing with like teaching, are real people going to understand this? If I explain a smart contract in this way, and I think back on it as my caveman brain, does my caveman Mm -hmm. brain understand it or is it (laughs) it too weird? And that's where I think that's probably my process is like by not not being a genius, (laughs) I'm able to know if other normal folks are going to be able to understand things and then kind of frame things in a way that normal folks can understand. And how do you test it? Do you do like rubber ducking or, you know, you just say it out loud or? I think it goes back to the shipping as my mode of operating. Like I probably just try a lot of things and see what resonate with folks. There's probably 50 different talks that I've done on Scaffold ETH and how to speed run Ethereum and how to get into Ethereum. And I'll do a lot of talks And I'll watch for the ones that seem to resonate with folks, the ones that seem to work, the ones that I keep getting inbound from people because Mm -hmm. of this specific article or this specific talk I gave. 
and then go back to that talk and say, what, you know, what is it about this that's resonating with folks and figure out like, and really, I think that a lot of it is trying not to be too nerdy, like trying to be more (laughs) mainstream and talk about things that resonate, but then be able to get into the weeds and say, you know, actually this isn't so complicated. Check this out. But yeah, there's a lot of just trial and error, I think. And I'm only successful because I failed five times before and the sixth time worked well, right? (laughs) So it's just lots of trying things, I think. Okay, so you like create many MVPs and just test them out in the market. Yep. Okay, and you know, like I bet that you have like thousand product ideas in your head all the time. So I'm wondering, how do you decide what should you focus on? Because, you know, obviously we only have 24 hours a day. Because it's a builder's curse, you know, it sometimes comes with the, okay, I want to ship 10 products and because I have side project and side project to side project and side to another. And this is like, you know, this recurring side project (laughs) or people just create one product and want to add like, you know, 85 features when sometimes it doesn't make sense at all. So I'm wondering how do you keep it neat and focus? That's a tough question. I think that I still struggle with that as a builder. I think we all struggle with that. Like every good project starts by registering some clever domain. And then sometimes it ends at registering (laughs) a clever domain, right? So I don't have a great answer for that. I do a lot of dabbling in a lot of places. And I do have 10 open projects right now. And I have artists that have created SVGs for me that I'm about to put into an NFT. And I have two or three different ones in the back burner. And it's kind of like, it's hard for me to decide which one of those things to focus on. And I bounce around a lot during the day between projects. And I (laughs) like, (laughs) I use as my forcing function, what thing can I put out today that will get forked 10 times tomorrow? My metric of success is seeing weird forks of the things I'm building by other people in production. Like a lot of people Mm -hmm. will see something that someone has copied from them and it hurts a little bit. Mm -hmm. And and now and then maybe it stings a little bit for me. But by putting that as a metric of success and saying, I want to see weird forks of my stuff. How do I make my stuff more forkable? How do I get it into people's hands and get them to understand that it's okay to take my idea and run with it? Mm -hmm. And kind of like maybe scale up a little bit. Maybe instead of me working on five projects and half-assing all of them, can I empower 20 builders to build 20 different things? And I'm doing more of a, just like making sure everybody is building through things. And I think that like one of my superpowers is to just sit down and build things. So I need to like carve out that time. But at the same time, I think if I want to scale up, I need to empower more folks and give them the stuff and the tools they need. And sometimes just give them the push to keep going. Mm -hmm. So some of it is more about like getting other people to focus on certain things (laughs) <laughs> and, and getting my own caveman brain to stop registering domains and, and deploy the thing that needs to be deployed. But things shift very quickly, right? Like I would say mm-hmm. right now, in terms of like good ideas, I would say right now, there's not a lot of competition in the multi-sig world. In particular, mm-hmm. multi-chain multi-sig. If someone released a great multi-chain multi-sig today to compete with the Gnosis Safe, I think they would capture a ton of value from the market. So... In the back of my mind, I'm saying, how do I prepare something to get there? And so I did a very forkable multi-sig with a back-end transaction handler. And I did a challenge that teaches you through call data and teaches you through how a multi-sig works. And then I go with Speedrun Ethereum, I add a new challenge to it that's building your own multi-sig. So I'm hoping just knowing that that product is that product market fit is out there. I'm floating the idea of multi-sigs to everybody and making sure that everyone, I want to see a thousand multi-sigs bloom out of this idea of there's a forkable example here and there's a real need in the ecosystem. So that's like one of 20 different irons I have in the fire that I'm nurturing Mm -hmm. and trying to get. But like thinking of it in terms of scale and thinking of it in terms of more people forking it and hopefully seeing more multi-sigs out there and we'll just see what happens. Kind of just like Mm -hmm. applying pressure where I can. But also, it's an impossible problem, though. As builders, if you love to build, you're always going to see that new idea as super fun, and the current idea is not as fun, because once you get into the details, it's more complicated. I have three comments to that. Like, the first one is, I have my, you know, personal theory, this whole startup idea 
has been created by domain providers just to sell more domains. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The TLDs are, are, yeah. The yeah. IOs of the world are making $70 for every idea you have. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is my small conspiracy theory. And <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is, you know, it's very interesting metrics where you say about that you want it to be as forkable as possible because it is a constraint that makes it necessary for keep very good documentation, which obviously is a problem for many developers because, you know, they want to build as fast as possible and don't think about other people using that that much. So, yeah, th this is a very interesting, like, heuristic that you can have to, to think about documentation. I push hard on a good readme. I understand you're a builder and you spent 15 hours on this repo but give me 15 <laughs> minutes on the readme. Just 15 minutes. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't need to be super complex. You don't need to explain the details. Just give me the commands I need to get this thing up and running and the few spots I should click around on to start understanding it myself. Put that in the mm -hmm. readme. Give me a good one sentence. What the heck is this thing for? Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you like, if you have some like readme driven development kind of going on, it doesn't have to be like, <laughs> I don't like when I land on a doc set of docs and it's like super like the ethers docs are super hard for me to look through. The ethers JS docs are a good example of great docs that are actually terrible. Like <laughs> it's so hard to find anything <laughs> there. There's not really a good cookbook of how do I actually apply this stuff. Instead of looking at the docs, you end up like Googling and finding something on Stack Exchange instead of finding yeah, the right classic. docs. <laughs> right, right. So, so this is an example where even if you're a great developer and you spend a ton of time on your documentation, it may not be the thing that people need. I always go to this like readme driven development where it's just like build something cool that can teach people and spend 15 minutes just talking through how they can get started and tinkering with it. And they'll mm -hmm. figure out most of it on their own. Give them the high leverage points. For Ethers JS, you're going to need to understand format Ether and parse utils. And you're going to need to understand big numbers. And you're going to need to understand providers and signers and wallets. But let's just make a quick quest that takes you through those things and gets you to learn all of those things instead of all that documentation. But the documentation, like mm -hmm. I'm nagging too hard on Rick Moo and his documentation. <laughs> Ethers JS is a critical piece of infrastructure for Ethereum. And Rick Moo is a genius. And he needs to just keep doing what he's doing. But but yeah, <laughs> yes, if you're a builder and you're building something, make sure you have an okay readme that I can land and understand what this thing is and fire it up pretty quickly and learn from it as I go. Yeah, and the first comment that I had regarding your metaphor that you are planting the seeds, like <laughs> one thing is you kind of very, you kind of circumvented your, problem with focus in a smart way because you focus, but you focus more like on a big problem, like multi-sig, instead of focusing on small products. So you can have like many projects in parallel, but they have this, you know, one common subject that they are covering. So I think it might be an interesting solution for builders to just pick a subject or pick a, a direction at least. Yep, for sure. And like pick something that is a superpower of Ethereum, right? like a, a staking app that gets a bunch of adversarial parties to coordinate, even though they don't trust each other. Or token vendor or something that uses tokens or the standards and understand that this is like an always-on vending machine and what kind of things need that kind of trust. Yeah, for sure. And finding places in the space that are either like empty, like the multi-sig, like there's not a lot of multi-sigs, or kind of out on the edge and really interesting like SVG NFTs. And putting SVGs mm -hmm. into the contract and having the contract render things, that's a super fun area to be tinkering around in right now. And L2s, right? Like tinkering around with SVG NFTs on L2s is going to be so fun. It, and it is fun, <laughs> but like people are going to find that in the next like quarter or summer. We're going to have L2 summer and it's just going to be all these mm -hmm. weird games and crafting and things. I'm excited for it. You know, that's very interesting. Like your position is very interesting because you see so many things being built that you are on this like cutting edge of the things that are happening. And you also see many like holes and gaps that you have mentioned, just like this multi-sig, because when you build a lot and you see many projects where people say, oh, I wish I had the tool like X, you kind of see these gaps, but you have like a, like most people who, who take this kind of positions are 
you know, they are on either like VCs or angel investors. So they have like good overview of the market, but they have on a more like theoretical side, like most of them don't have such a close contact with, with the market as you have. So yeah, th this is a very interesting position to be in, just, just a comment. And they're interesting in pumping their bags too, right? Like a yeah, VC yeah. can see that we need a better multi-sig, but if they don't have a team to execute on it, they're not going to say anything to anyone else or yeah. empower anybody else to do that, right? So one thing that you mentioned there that really gets me thinking is when you're talking about building a good product, a lot of times, especially in the Wild West, like it is right now, you try to build this over-encompassing big picture product. We're going to make uh, blogs for <laughs> Web3 or something, right? Yeah. And then you realize, oh, fuck, like the infrastructure is totally, like there's no infrastructure to do this and there's four missing products there. So it's almost like by trying to build a big picture tool, you learn the holes and then you find a product that fits in one of those little holes. Same thing with like building a good game right now on Ethereum. Don't build a gigantic game. Build a game component. Because everything is all composable and everything is forkable, build a good system of, I use the word loot and I don't mean yeah. the NFT project loot, but I mean like mm -hmm. the game concept of loot having an inventory and having that inventory mm -hmm. follow you from site to site and having just a good standardized inventory where I can send a bunch of NFTs in and they're all owned by my loot bag and I can send that loot bag around. And maybe that loot bag is like using ML to draw the little images of things, right? Build a really good component that a lot of other builders can build on and you'll find success there. If you try to build some great big game and that's over that's encompasses all these different things it may not land as well as you're hoping find those little components that those builders need mm -hmm. and build that thing first oh that's very interesting perspective because like many builders they are like we are building metaverse super right. social gaming app for play to earn and staking and dig and there's exchange inside and like everything inside so this is a problem, especially if you don't have good components that you can use. Like, you know, it's like, you know, trying to set up Uber in 2004 when there was no iPhone. Like, you know, you can do it, but like making apps for Nokia was shit. So like, <laughs> you know, and so like, good luck with that. For sure. Exactly. Yep. So like, I'm wondering, like, what's your, like, you know, let's say that you have decided to build something. So what's your process from the idea to an MVP? What are the steps that you are taking? So like, thankfully I have Scaffold ETH and Scaffold ETH is a tool for me to get that prototype into someone's hands. So I've, I've done a bunch of sessions on it, but Scaffold ETH is like a DAP creation toolkit. And I'm trying to make it kind of like the, like the WordPress of building. You know how WordPress, back in the day, you could go to wordpress.com and just like launch a product right there on, mm -hmm. on WordPress, or you could fork it. And that like goes against their business model in a really big way, yeah. right? They should either be a SaaS product or they should be a forkable repo. But by doing both, they're sort of competing with themselves, but in a very altruistic kind of wonderful way. And we saw so many things come out of that. Same thing with Scaffold ETH. I want Scaffold ETH to be something that you could really lightly just say, oh, I need an NFT marketplace. Let's go grab this marketplace. Let's fork it. Let's change a few things and let's deploy it. Or you could say like, I, you know, I really want to get into this thing and kind of build something more advanced and get into it. So with Scaffold ETH, though, it is a dap out of the box. You go straight to tinkering with your solidity, and then there's an app mm -hmm. on the front end that auto adapts. So as you add new things to your smart contract, you get new interfaces in your front end and you kind of build there. So when I want to build something new, I usually fork down Scaffold ETH and I tinker with the solidity first and I get a feel for... Am I using mappings? Am I using an array of structs? Like, mm -hmm. what does this thing feel like? How can I do it mostly off chain? What needs to be on chain? And I get the experience right there. And then I build a little UI for it. And then I deploy it to Surge or some kind of like quick website. But I do all of that in about an hour. I go from hour. tinkering oh. to, yeah, about an hour is the first prototype that usually goes to a URL or maybe three hours. Like, Worst case scenario, three hours. But if you Google like Austin Griffiths showing off solidity, you'll find me doing mm -hmm. it in 30 minutes to 45 minutes. So I tinker with the smart contract. I poke at it from the front end. I make a super simple front end and I deploy that to a live 
test net, and then I deploy the app to a live location, and I share that URL with people, and I say, go tinker with this and see what, what you mm-hmm. think. So Scaffold ETH is really kind of the TLDR there. I use Scaffold ETH to quickly prototype and get a decentralized app into the wild within an hour. And you can obviously spend a lot more time on it. But then thanks to Scaffold ETH, a whole bunch of other branches have been created, right? This is kind of like the WordPress of dApps because now dApp is such a hard word, of decentralized (laughs) apps, (laughs) So if you're looking for an app that lets you leverage up, there's one that you can fork, right? If you're looking for an app for a signature-based NFT marketplace, we're going to have all these different really forkable SVG NFT. Like, Mm -hmm. if go look at Lugies. It'll take you 10 minutes to make your own SVG NFT and then another 20 minutes to get it deployed live, right? Like, within 30 minutes, you can make your own SVG NFT project on mainnet if you want. Thanks to Scaffold ETH and a lot of these, like, starter kits that kind of came out of the starter kit. There's like the generic starter kit. And then there's like all these other kind of like a tech tree of after you know NFTs and you know this, then you can fork this. So Scaffold ETH is the short answer to that. The long answer is kind of more (laughs) more interesting. But yeah, Scaffold ETH is the way that I prototype quickly. Okay, like one hour, this is like a very great goal to have to ship something. And I'm wondering like when you have it out, how do you distribute it? Do you just share it on Twitter or some of your Discord channels, mailing list, or you know, where do you test your apps? Great question. And builders at home, you need to be louder about the things you're building. And also, on the other side of that, psychologically, you're really married to this project and you're really into it. You don't know if it's good or not. You think it's great, <laughs> but it might suck, actually. <laughs> so like, put it out there and let people use it. But be open to understanding that people might hate it and you need to iterate, right? Like the first project you build, even if you go into the dark for months on it, when you release it, it's not going to pop off the way you think it is. Humans need to use things and humans need to try things, especially in Web3 where the user experience is so bad. Build things and show them off. Crypto Twitter is a good place. Also, Telegram groups, Discord servers, like find a good community. But just like also just be tweeting stuff and tagging builders and just be loud about stuff. Build a thing and show it off and see how people use it and repeat that process. Build another thing and show it off and see how people use it. You do that iteration three or four times, you're going to get really good at shipping things and really good at like, it doesn't need to be perfect. It can be good and get it out there and good is good enough for a prototype. Mm -hmm. And one of those good things is going to stick and someone's going to say, oh, I want to use this and you'll get traction. And then you can kind of go to the next phase with that and take Mm -hmm. it instead of from just zero to one, take it from one to 10 and make a real product out of it. But really just keep building, keep showing things off. Don't go into the dark. Don't be too married to a project. Be able to receive feedback. Be able to see, I put it out there and no one cared. I need to move on. (laughs) Like, don't keep sticking that. (laughs) <laughs> like build other things, even come back to it. Maybe it was the wrong time. Like if I released Galley Ass right now, I think people would love it. But when I released Galley Ass in 2017, it was like, no one really cared. Like I even showed it to like really prominent people. Like, look how cool this thing is. I'm playing a, a web three game on my phone and those are ERC twenties. And this is an ERC 721. Mm-hmm. And this land is all procedurally generated. And it's like, here's my card. Yeah. Call me. It's like, no, this is cool. Come on. <laughs> So, so just keep showing it off, but be willing to know that like people are going to crap on your idea. People are going to steal your idea. And th- those are good things. Like you need that to happen to get to where you want to go, I think. Okay. Yeah, that was a good advice. I'm wondering if there's any like, you know, hashtags or like any Discord groups or like anything like in particular that, you know, whenever I want to build something, I should just, you know, mention it on, on my Twitter or Discord or like anywhere like, you know, some place on the internet? That's a good question. I think that like, sometimes you can tag certain folks that might be interested in it. I mean, if you're building something with Scaffold ETH and you're releasing it, tag me. Like, I'm always good for a good retweet (laughs) now and then for good projects. Like, I'm always looking for people that are building with Scaffold ETH and I want to enable them and empower them. But say you're building the multi-sig, right? Let's say you Mm -hmm. build a pretty decent baby multi-sig. It works fine. There's a transaction relayer. Anybody can fork it. It just like works smoother than the Gnosis safe. You can Mm -hmm. wallet connect into things. There's less headaches. Say you have that. How do you show it off? 
I would not say that you should go show it off to Gnosis. I wouldn't say that. I mean, Gnosis might be like, hey, that one's better. Let's buy it. But like generally what you should do is find the users. Where does Gnosis Safe have product market fit? They have product market fit in the DAO space. They have product market fit because a lot of projects have decentralized and now they have mm-hmm. this token and there's all this tooling that needs to exist around being sufficiently decentralized, but using the token for voting mm-hmm. or paying the token to developers. What tools do you use to distribute that token to your developers? How are you keeping track of things? Is it all still just in a spreadsheet? Like, So if I was building that multi-sig, I would be getting in front of DAOs that need multi-sigs and say, hey, what, you know, like, Try using this. What problems are you getting into? Can I get into your GitHub and see the biggest issues and see if I can, you know, somehow alleviate some of those things? And when I do, you're the person I'm going to tag on Twitter when I've got a small prototype, Mm -hmm. right? So I think that like find the people that are actually using the products and are annoyed by them and build a better product Mm -hmm. that's less annoying and get it in front of them. Okay. Thank you for that. So (laughs) I I will also share one tip from myself that. If you want to reach a bigger project, it might be pretty hard to reach like either founders or, or their own Twitter because like they have many DMs. But if you go to their Discord and just write, hey, I have a cool project that you might be interested in, very often some people, whether they are like community managers or, or whoever, like moderators, they can reach out to you. And it's much easier to contact these people through Discord than for Twitter because Twitter is more messy, like there's so much noise yep. there. For sure. Yep. And find issues in their GitHub. Like go to a project you love and go look at the issues in their GitHub and just start contributing. Like a lot of what happens here happens organically and it kind of emerges. Like I may not even know that I need a person that does a certain thing in my Scaffold ETH community, but then someone starts Mm -hmm. to do it and I'm like, oh, wow, that's actually really valuable. Let's get them a stream of ETH and let's like empower them to do this at 10x. Yeah, that's the beauty of DAOs. I read a tweet like some time ago that some guy was in a DAO and he said there was some developer that just came in, just finished some pull requests, just collected, you know, like, you know, $500 for the bounties and just moved on. And this is like so crazy. Like imagine joining like Google and just... As a random person, just yeah. you cannot do Shipping it. Like, maps it's and then heading out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're seeing that though. And we're seeing that people want to work for multiple DAOs. And so a yeah. DAO needs to do a good job of paying someone when they're there and then letting them peace out for a while. And then if they come back, making sure there's a stream of ETH for them waiting, you know, just keeping people empowered and keeping people building. Yeah. I'm wondering like about your build guild project because like for those who don't know it's like curated like social network of ethereum developers i'm not sure whether it's a precise description but that's how i understood it so could you share like the idea of this project like why have you built it so the build guild kind of going back to scaffold eth was a starter kit and then i started i saw people forking that and making new starter kits you know an optimism starter kit an nft starter kit I wanted to empower and incentivize folks to keep doing that. So the build yield is basically an incentivization layer on top of Scaffold ETH. What I'm doing is I'm finding folks that are contributing. They're on their own, their own educational journey. They're learning about Ethereum as they go, and I'm doing my best to help teach them, but I'm also going to reward them with a little bit of ETH too. So they're getting an mm-hmm. education. They're getting a little bit of ETH. They're building things so they can learn, but then hopefully they'll kind of like feed some of that learning back and create a new repo with a good readme that teaches about commit reveal after they learned it, right? Or I just learned ZK voting, so now I'm going to make a nice readme and I'm going to teach that back to folks. And so someone who submits to me, you know, a good ZK voting app with with a good readme is like an automatic, like with a thousand dollars from your ETH stream. Mm -hmm. And so what I needed to do is create a bunch of streams of ETH. And that's what the Build Guild is. It's about 50 different smart contracts that are all basically the same contract that are streaming Mm -hmm. tokens. And they're streaming in a way where the builder withdraws and prices their own work. So it's very trust first. I meet you. I see that you're contributing. I open up a stream to you. 
And it's up to you to kind of find the best things for the ecosystem, build things that are helpful, and then you turn in your own work and you withdraw from your stream. And that's kind of like where Build Guild kind of version one, version mm -hmm. two have led us. And then kind of around that, I'm noticing, well, we, you know, there's a lot of social stuff that needs to happen here. We need to pitch ideas to each other. We need to be able to show off our builds to each other. So Build Guild V3, which is kind of like kind of slowly launching right now, is more of like a social network. There's the mm -hmm. Build Guild Bazaar. If you go to bazaar.buildguild.com, you see a whole bunch of builders, not necessarily even in the Build Guild, but they're shilling their wares as if you're at a bazaar, mm -hmm. right? They're shilling all their different builds. So you can go, this is kind of like a meeting point to find other builders and find things that you can fork. And you can learn what other people are working on. You can see their status. So that's bizarre. Then we have this idea of this product called Roundtable. That's kind of like everyone is mm -hmm. equal and you're pitching ideas and people can like use their Web3 wallet to like those ideas. And then we have this oh. idea of like rally, where if, if an idea gets a lot of likes, we kind of turn it into a rally and we rally around it and we rally capital and we rally builders, kind of creating a small multi-sig with stakeholders and some capital. And then if those builders end up meeting that milestone, we have what's called a feast, which is like we pay out to the developers for me meeting the milestone from the money that was rallied. So just mm -hmm. like finding, first of all, just like incentivizing builders to build on Scaffold ETH and build forkable mm -hmm. things and build things that other people are going to fork. Mm -hmm. And then around that, finding the social aspect of it and figuring out where we need a ceremony and figuring out where, mm -hmm. where we need to be really be humans for a minute and then go back to our asynchronous tech life, right? So the build guild is the incentivization layer and then probably the social layer around that that kind of helps folks manage and kind of keep up with what everybody's working on and stuff like that. So that's sort of like the Build Guild right now versus where Build Guild is going is more of this social network thing. Many people has been asking the same question for the last like half year. And this question is like, what's the YC in Web3? You know, like Y Combinator alternative. Yep. And, you know, from what I hear, like Build Guild, like at least this, you know, end goal is the closest to Web3 native YC that I've heard so far. because. Like when people think, oh, let's build a web free YC, what they do is just that uh, they just copy YC and VCs just get create involved. a Discord and yeah. they, they just make a Discord <laughs> channel, you know? And it's like, oh, we are web free. But like it doesn't use all the superpowers of web free. But in your case, you know, the idea to just pull the capital and vote with your wallets, you know, having multi sticks, like this is a really like web free native way of solving this problem of you know, builders not having sometimes resources to just develop their projects. So it sounds super cool. To lean into that a little bit, like a new funding mechanism is retroactive public goods funding, stuff that Carl and Vitalik are talking about. Mm -hmm. This is like totally not VC native, right? I would say if you look at a Web3 project and its goal is empowering builders, but the funding is coming from a specific VC, I would be very hesitant about that. I mean. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a net positive for the space. Go build stuff. Go do it. Like, you're going to end up in one of those VCs pockets eventually <laughs> with your product. But like, that's OK. But rolling back to more like the Build Guild, where it's very open and very open ended, that's that's kind of what, what we're trying to push, I think. Very interesting idea. I think VCs have their place, of, especially in bear markets, yeah. you know, because, you know, when people don't want to raise their own capital because all their crypto goes down, it's good to have people with pockets full of fiat money <laughs> so that they can just turn into crypto at low prices and, and just, you know, fuel the project. But I think like in the long run, this kind of like community owned funds, I don't know, like I wouldn't call you a fund, but it's more like it. I even don't have a name. That's and that's actually a good thing. It's even before incubator, right? Like it's more <laughs> yeah. like ecosystem development. Like once it gets to, oh, we've got a guy with a multi-sig that needs a partner and they want to go, like that's beyond me. And, and there's lots of good incubators in the space. My buddy Cena is working on like Zeitgeist right now, which, which is like, yeah. if I can get builders to him, he can take them from one to 10 and have everything they need. It's like getting that first 
thing going. And we're we're more of just like an ecosystem development kind of area yeah. where we're just like finding the generic components that the ecosystem makes needs and making them. And then if someone makes them and they're ready to go pro, kind of they they can eject out of the build guild, either building their own product, becoming an auditor, or going to work somewhere. That's always like an option. And it, that's a win state for me. If someone you know, goes through my education platform and then they go somewhere else. That's like, that's good. That's like seeing a fork of your thing in production, <laughs> right? That's a win when you go work somewhere or you become an auditor or you deploy your own product. I'm wondering because as far as I know, you have registered in Wyoming as a DAO officially, Yep. which is uh, not so obvious because many crypto projects just go full pirate mode and they just don't register anywhere at all. So I'm wondering why have you decided to incorporate and was it a pain in the ass to just go through the paperwork <laughs> or, you know, was it smooth? So I'll credit my little brother, Zach Griffith. He ran with this most of it. His big contribution so far to the Build Guild was getting us incorporated. He had to do a lot of footwork and get it going, but it wasn't that hard. And really, I think Vitalik spoke about this in at ETH Denver. What Wyoming has done is just made it okay. They didn't have to do a ton of work. They just said, okay, you can make an LLC and it's a DAO. And that's all really the work they had to do. It's all of us that's kind of, we're filling in and doing the work for them, right? So they just open it up and they make it doable. And then we, you know, we have to register. We have to give, you had to give a contract address. You have to let them know what your articles of incorporation are. You have to have a few things. You have to have your members listed. Are you member run or are you algorithmic? Like what kind of a DAO is it? But like, again, like at the top of the bell curve, so is my little brother. <laughs> like if Zach can figure it out, you at home can figure it out. Like we basically <laughs> became an LLC because we wanted to be able to accept more mainstream funding. So for the EF to be able to say, you know, here is some funding for speedrun Ethereum, for Build Guild, here is some funding. We need that legal separation because we do some weird things and deploy some weird things with Build Guild. If they're just like funding us straight up, maybe. So the LLC is basically that legal separation. Like Build Guild mm-hmm. LLC DAO receives funding from the EF and it's our job to you know make the ecosystem better, make sure builders are funded, make sure that their streams are full. And it was mainly just for that like legal separation, but also like we made it an, a Wyoming LLC because I grew up in Wyoming and I just wanted to do it. And I <laughs> wanted to see what okay. it was like. So a lot of it was just like F around and see what happens. And it wasn't that hard. We were able to do it pretty easily. Okay. I got a few questions till the end. Like one of my favorite one is like, if you had a magic wand and could end any problem in Web3, what would you, you know, solve? We've got a few problems, right? Inclusivity is a problem. We have some arguing between some different factions of folks that I wish I could wave a magic wand and get everyone to kind of get along and keep building. I wish that the infrastructure was better. There's a handful of products that have been created that are like 60% good, not 80 or 90% good. Like if you're a Web3 user, and you're not a little bit mad at MetaMask every day, you're not using it enough. (laughs) Like MetaMask, Infura, there's a lot of infrastructure stuff that could be better. And I worry that by them capturing the market early, we're going to have this bad user experience for years to come. And I wish I could wave a magic wand and go back to 2017 Austin and say, spend the next year and build a better wallet, make the experience better, just do a better job. But like, obviously, like Dan and crew at MetaMask have a big challenge in front of them. They're doing the best they can. MetaMask is used by millions of people. Like, it's obviously doing a good enough job. It's just like another magic wand I would wave is just like, gosh, this is frustrating. Like, even Gitcoin Grants is about to happen. I have never used a more frustrating product than Gitcoin Grants. But it's doing (laughs) its job. It's working, right? But God, it's infuriating to use. And so it's like, if I could wave a magic wand, there's a lot of this, like there are certain first movers that have captured the market that are garbage products. And I wish I could wave a magic wand and not let them capture the market and Mm. have some other product kind of fill the void there and become a good example is Truffle. Truffle was a 60% good. But it was so confusing for some people. And they and building on Web3 is already so complicated that the tooling needs to be lights out, simple, and obvious. Yeah. And now we see hard hat, and hard hat is way better. And it's just like objectively better to use. 
but it, like when I was complaining about truffle two years ago, people were like, eh, just use it. It's fine. Like it's going to be the thing. It's like, <laughs> no, like something better is going to come along and it's going to show you guys that this is better. And, and hard hat did that. So I think we need the hard hat of MetaMask. We need the hard hat mm-hmm. of RPC providers. We need the hard hat mm-hmm. of tooling. And dang it, I don't mean to throw shade on all these like <laughs> core infrastructure for years, right? So many products Consensus has provided. Like the Web3 that we know now runs on that. But damn, I wish it could have been 80 or 90% better instead of 60% good. <laughs> Another thing we need is auditors. Damn, we need more auditors in this space, right? That is a, <laughs> like, how do we get you from I'm building a product with Solidity to I'm tackling the Ethernet DAO challenges to I can actually like, you know, softly audit things to now I'm an auditor. How do we fill that pipeline and make sure no one's getting blocked on it? Auditing is another thing. Oh, I just wanted to say that it reminds me of, you know, Microsoft Windows domination. Like it wasn't like a best operating systems in the world, but because it was like one of the first and especially like the one that got the best distribution, it ended up dominating and it still dominates. Like business still. Yeah. 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 And it's so hard to use. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm a Mac person. So whenever like I have to come back to Windows because I use other computer of my friend or something, I'm like, what the hell? Like, Yeah. So bad. I plug HDMI in and it doesn't work automatically. And then I Google it and there's, there's garbage and ads and there's a 20 step process for how I hook up my HDMI. Today, if you go look at things, you see this exact same thing with MetaMask. Like, oh, I'm having this problem with MetaMask. Here's the, here's a 20 pager on how to fix it. Like, (laughs) no, that's not the answer. (laughs) Yeah. So like, you know, coming from the other side, like what were the most mind-blowing web free projects that you have seen? Something that was so creative or inspiring that just made you really, you know, just look at it and just shake your head and like, wow, like it, it was good. I feel like like leading up to DeFi summer, when was that like 2019? We had Maker and we have over collateralized loans and we had some of the key pieces. We had lending, we had Ave. But something happened in like August of 2019 where just like a ton of innovation went into smart contracts and a ton of people tried a bunch of things. And some of them didn't work. Some of them blew up. Some of them were food tokens that taught us all a lesson, right? (laughs) That kind of stuff is really exciting to me. And I'm seeing it again in the NFT space around like auctions, the Shalom's auction that just went off where it was like, if the top 50 change within 10 minutes, the the auction restarts. Or talking about Dan again, the mat auction. There are these auction primitives that allow, instead of I have these hundred items and I want to auction them Mm -hmm. off, how about I'll mint as many items as we need to efficiently give them out to the highest bidders, right? Changing that a little bit. And it's like, oh shit, like you can do that on Ethereum with a couple lines of code. So in the NFT space, we're seeing like SVG NFTs, we're seeing composable crafting and gaming. We're also seeing auctions and interesting things. And and in that kind of realm, that's where I'm excited to see people play. I think we'll, we'll see more DeFi, we'll see more lending. And then the DAO tooling space is huge right now. Going back to the Gnosis mm. Safe having product market fit, we have a ton of DAOs that have a ton of treasury and people that want to help them work. And they're basically coordinating out of spreadsheets. And so any DAO yeah. tooling right now is really high leverage. And I love seeing people just play around and learn and try things in that space. Okay. So I have like the, the last formal question here. What has been the most funny, like the funniest thing that had happened to you during this web free journey? Oh, man. Ah, I, I, so like the times that I have the most fun is either when it's just me and I've got an idea and I'm building and it just like the tool just works, right? Like I don't get any headaches. I focus on what I want to build. I'm able to build it quickly. Even if I build it and it's not the thing I thought it was going to be, like the process of putting the thing out there and trying is just like a lot better. Mm. And on the other side of that, the time that I have the most fun with folks around me is we do build guild Bowtie Fridays, where we just show off what we're building. Mm -hmm. And it's like a group of 10 or 15 builders that get on and they just show what they're building with Scaffold ETH. The other day we had, I created these Lugies, which were just a really forkable SVG NFT. 
And then a buddy Damu made them optimistic loogies, put them on optimism. And then he made them fancy loogies where you have a bow tie and you can put the bow tie Mm -hmm. on the loogie and the bow tie is an NFT itself. And just like all of us on that call, just kind of like minting our loogies and and doing (laughs) NFT crafting and doing NFT composability. And then another guy made a loogie tank and we could send all of our loogies to that loogie tank. And then we made OE40s that were kind of like a public goods, like a retroactive public goods token that you can sip from the 40 and you earn some buzz tokens. So like the innovation of just like playing around with composable, forkable NFTs and not trying to make a ton of money, but just like kind of doing cool things. Mm -hmm. I really love that. And I really enjoy that. And I really love the group of folks kind of around me that are building these things that that I get to play with. (laughs) It reminds me of a jazz band that's doing this, you know, just jamming and doing improvisation. Yep. So like one person starts something and then you, you know, turn it around and... Heck yeah. It may be even like MEV. MEV stuff is really interesting, right? Like all the stuff yeah. that happens, it's like it's like way over my head. But anytime I learn about, like when I first learned about flash loans, it was just like, mm. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like those, <laughs> those goosebump moments happen, you know, every few months in Ethereum. And so like, I just love when that happens. <laughs> okay. So Austin, like, thanks a lot for our conversation. Like, you know, when we chatted on Twitter, you said, oh, it will be like only 30 minutes because <laughs> I, ha- I don't have too much to say, but we already made an hour, but this was like a very, very dense hour. And I will have a v- big problem with, you know, getting only like three or four things to the Twitter description of this uh, <laughs> episode. Speed run Ethereum. <laughs> the most important thing, if you're a Web2 developer, go speedrunethereum.com. It's like a really <laughs> succinct, like easy, like onboarding from Web2 to Web3, speedrunethereum.com. <laughs> also like Austin, so where people should go, like they should go to speedrunethereum.com. They should follow Austin Griffith on Twitter for sure. Is there any other place that you want our listeners to? That's the entry point. Like okay. speedrun Ethereum will lead you to the tooling and the tooling will help you get a hold of Solidity. And then from there, you'll be able to fork a lot of other things. So speedrunethereum.com is really like the focal point. But yeah, hit me up, tag me on Twitter. I'm at Austin Griffith on Twitter. Perfect. So Austin, last questions. Because we had like this builder-oriented conversation and I'm wondering... Do you know any person that might be a good fit for this kind of talk that we had? Hmm. Let's see. Have you, I mean, like Owaki and Nick from ENS are also like two people. Have you interviewed both of them already? No, no, but I would love to interview them. It would be super cool because this is one of my favorite projects. So the Optimism team, Carl, like they're working on an L2, but they're also working on public goods funding. Like that's a good area to look at. Like, Basically, the L2s are the most important thing in the next few months, right? So Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, CK Sync, get a community member from each one of those and ask them, like, you know, how do we get started on your L2 and get that material out to builders? Yeah. Okay. So Austin, like, thanks a lot. It was super, super interesting. And yeah, like, see you in the Twitterverse. Awesome. (laughs) I'm out there. Yeah. (laughs) I thought of another one, Sam, who works on Ethereum.org. Sam would be a good guy to talk to, too. Let me know and I can connect you there. He just thinks a lot about a lot of this stuff and and is, you know, really smart. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Austin, and have a good day. Thanks for having me. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey.